I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to Betsy Parrish, professor of ESL teacher education, education at Hamline University. Here with all of you, I see people from uh, really every corner of the world, which is ex really, really exciting. And um, just to say a little bit more, um, like Drew, I'm under snow here in Minnesota, and I work in a state where we have among the highest number of refugee, uh, refugees per capita in the United States. And we work with families um, who represent over 100 home languages. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work for many, many years in Minnesota on helping to meet the needs of a highly diverse group of learners. Um, but if you are not from the United States where I'm um, working, uh, rest assured that I think a lot of what we'll work on today will be really relevant for you. I've had the privilege of working with teachers in Bangladesh, India, and Vietnam, and also with groups of teachers who've um, come to Hamlin to do intensive programs. Those teachers have been from um, China. And in all of these settings, we've really been turning our attention to meeting the demands of the 21st century for all learners in our language classrooms. So we're going to talk about what we mean by that. What are those demands of today's world? And then um, we'll talk briefly about some shifts in the field. And those are particularly here in the United States, but I think they represent shifts all over the world. Then turn to what we mean by high leverage practices and why they're needed, and then I'll be doing a number of demonstrations. So then at the end, as Drew said, we'll have, uh, we should have plenty of time for some Q&A. So, so what do we mean? Um, when I talk about the demands of today's world, I'm going to use an example of an English learner that I might work with here in the United States, but be thinking about learners in your settings as well. So imagine the adult English learner who needs to enroll their child in a school. And here in the states that might involve interpreting information presented in a variety of formats and oftentimes online, so accessing information online. And then um, when you're looking at that, it might be presented in a chart, it might be in an infographic. Um, and then the, um, this learner in our class might need to make decisions then based on the information provided and finally register their child online. So there are a lot of things that we need to do in today's world that go way beyond English, right? So I want you to think personally for yourself. What is something that, um, like something that you've had to uh, do, a task you've had to complete recently? And then think to yourself, um, now what skills were involved? What did I have to do to be successful? So Drew is going to share, we're going to do a short poll here. And for each poll question, I want you to respond. Do you do this every day, every week, every month? I mean, you might even, maybe it's every hour. So let's do this poll. If you could answer the first one, do you, how often do you interpret charts and tables? Okay, so getting a lot of every day, every week responses here, right? Okay, I'll leave this just up. We'll just do each of these for, you know, a minute here. Okay. So, right, what we're seeing is that, you know, over half of you have to interpret charts and tables, graphics of some sort, um, at least every week, if not every day, um, and many of you every month. Great. Okay, let's go on to the next one. How about collaborate with others using technology? How often do you do that? Okay, so you're doing it right now, right? <laughs> Look at this. So, you know, looks like most of us do this every day, right? Okay, let's go to the next one. How about use information to draw conclusions and make decisions? How often do we do that? Every day, every week, every month? Okay. All right. So now, now think about it. Think about how you acquired those skills. Uh, you you try you experience it. I'm sorry. You you um, develop those skills by experience. Maybe by direct instruction. Maybe um, you've had some courses or the ways of instruction where you teach or learned really focus on using this kind of information. 
but you might work with students whose formal educational setting is very different, or you might work with students who have very limited prior formal schooling. And as we look at how often we use these skills and strategies, like interpreting graphics, using technology to collaborate, or drawing conclusions, making decisions, among many other skills, we realize that if you don't have those and you can't enact those skills in a second or for another language, you could be at a real disadvantage, couldn't you? So what does that mean for us as teachers? So these tasks, they require that we use effective communication, collaboration, critical thinking. We need to comprehend complex informational texts, and those could be oral texts, written texts, uh, print or digital. And the skills, those four skills, they're needed everywhere. So I think it's most obvious that we need those skills of collaboration, effective communication at work and at school, right? I think that's what's most obvious to us. Um, we need to do you know, um, collaboration on teams with others. We need to interpret graphics and all sorts of informational text. But at home, if you're working with English language learners in an English dominant country, those learners need to read mail selectively. They need to you know, listen to important messages and take notes. They need to make decisions about healthcare in their communities and so on and so forth. So again, this is just building the case for why it's really essential that the instruction that we provide goes beyond just the basics of language, right? So um, in the United States, we have a variety of shifts in the field that have really impacted instruction. Um, we have a variety of standards that we're teaching to. Also, there's legislation in the United States that's demanding and really you know, pushing us to provide instruction that helps learners become work ready and be able to find you know, family, jobs with family sustaining wages. But in any case, I think that the occupational demands everywhere in the world are becoming more and more complex as we need to access information in a variety of languages. We also want to remember that the learners in classes we serve come with a variety of backgrounds. So some may have very um, limited prior formal schooling or may have come as uh, refugees if it's here in the United States, or they may have a credential or an advanced degree from their country. Um, doing school can look very different around the world. So in some places, it might be quite teacher-centered. Maybe there haven't been opportunities for learners to really um, challenge assumptions or um, be rewarded in their educational settings for really thinking critically. Um, and yet, if they're working maybe globally, internationally, or working um, here in the United States, there's going to be an expectation that they are, are able to work on teams, um, really um, think deeply and critically about a variety of issues. So all of these factors really call for what we're calling high leverage instructional practices. Okay, so what are those? You're probably asking yourself right now, what do, what do we mean by that? So Neri and all, um, in a report that they wrote regarding K-12 education, um, they consider high leverage uh, principles. They think even, you know, kind of bigger picture of high leverage principles. And they call them high leverage principles because they've been developed by leaders and scholars in the field. And they're sort of these tried and true um, ways of teaching that have been shown to be really effective for English learners. And I'm thinking of it here today as high lever leverage practices. And we'll see that it's those practices that serve to scaffold learning, address the academic language demands of a lesson, promote collaboration among learners, and prompt critical thinking. And so we'll see that, for example, let's suppose you have a reading lesson that you want to teach. You want to go beyond just the text and some comprehension questions. We're going to see that it's by virtue of the instructional decisions we make, the instructional practices we choose, we are able to really leverage those so that we not only work on reading, but we also promote all of the skills that you see here on the slide. And we're going to see what that looks like through some samples today. Um, I, this graphic is intended to show you this idea that it's the practices themselves or the, the ways that we teach. For example, uh, choosing to use graphic organizers or using jigsaw activities or providing language frames for students, or, or really creating questions that matter 
In other words, not just simple display questions in our instruction where there's just one right answer, but really think about questions that matter, that get students to really think critically. The practices themselves then prompt and heighten the four elements that you see on the right. Scaffolds for learning, academic language, collaboration, and critical thinking that, as I said, have all been shown to be critical in today's world. Okay, so let's start with a sample that's at the beginning, high beginning level. And I really want to highlight the fact that everything that we work through today is meant to show you strategies or classroom practices that you could use with any text, with any material, curriculum, and at any level. So, you know, as you look at the samples, think to yourself, okay, how would I use that with a text I, I just encountered in my curriculum yesterday or in a textbook that I'm using? All right. So we're going to start off with a short reading lesson. And oftentimes I find that in the materials that are out there, um, not all, but oftentimes there'll be a text, a reading text, and some comprehension questions, which is a start, which is great. But I want to show you that by choosing some really high leverage practices, we can prompt much, much deeper practice. So let's start with what we would do for pre-reading with a short uh, text. Um, students are going to work with a very short text on the life of President Barack Obama. But to start with, let's use a KWL chart. So a K is what do I know about President Barack Obama already? What do I want to learn? And then go back to this chart later, as you'll see, and think about what did I learn? So KWL has the benefit of helping students explore their prior knowledge about the topic. You can provide an accompanying visual of President Obama sort of to get them thinking about what they, what they know but what they want to learn. And so if you think about our principles today, this KWL chart, which is a graphic organizer, it provides a scaffold for making predictions. So all of this helps to provide direction and relevance to the text that we're going to see here. Okay, so this could be our pre-reading task. So be thinking now, okay, how could I use KWL with one of the topics that I've recently worked on in my curriculum that I might try next week? All right, so now um, the first time the students read the text, they're simply going to check their KWL for their predictions. So look at their K and see if their predictions were accurate or if any of them were addressed in the reading and then see if they find any answers to the questions that they might have posed in the W of the chart. Okay? All right. So, next, the learners will go back to the text again. And what you'll notice with these high leverage practices is that we really want to milk a text. We want to look at it multiple times um, doing the predictions, reading to confirm predictions, and now we're going to give students a chance to read and scan for some key ideas, but to do that, use a graphic organizer like the timeline you see here. So what are the benefits of doing that? Well, by doing so, learners are getting practice with transferring information that's presented as a text, written, and then um, seeing how it could be in, um, presented visually. So by doing that, we're giving them practice in knowing how to interpret information presented in a variety of formats. Okay. Next, we're going to go back to the text and read it closely. But as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes um, readings will have a, a, a question that's more of a display question. For example, um, when did President Obama get married? All right. So we can just look right there at the text and find the answer to that question. But what if we ask questions like these, true or false? President Obama started a family right after getting married. That requires a lot more analysis on, on the part of the students. So the reader must analyze that what, what does right after mean anyway? Well, if he got married in 1992 and the text said that he started a family in 1998, that would be then that statement would be false because right after is not six years later okay so this is this idea of just making sure that you're asking questions that really matter questions that are going to prompt some critical thinking okay so then the students can go back to their kwl chart with a partner and check to see if their assumptions were correct or not 
see if they found any answers to the questions they posed in the W, and then record what they learned about President Obama. So, so we took a short text and we looked at a variety of tasks, activities that we could use with this short reading. And now let's see how we did. I want you to think about this. So did the activities that you just saw scaffold learning? Why don't you just do a show of hands? Click, if you see at the top, you should, on your screen there, um, how many think that we, we scaffolded learning? How about, did we build academic language? And did we promote collaborations and prompt critical thinking? I see a lot of hands going up, right? Okay, you can keep those hands coming, but we'll, we'll get to do this a few more times um, together. So just think about that. So the scaffolds, well, what scaffolds did we see? The KWL chart was a scaffold for making predictions. It was a scaffold for activating prior knowledge about a topic. It allowed the students to create their own list of questions and do some selective reading, right? Um, building academic language is sometimes less obvious when you're working with a beginning level text, but it's that idea of asking questions that might draw their attention to some of the academic language when they're at that level. So for example, the meaning of right after. Or part of academic language is being able to recognize the structure of a text. So this text was a chronology. So the timeline graphic organizer was a scaffold, but in my mind it was also a way to build that academic language. Um, the promoting collaborations for this one was doing the partner work with the KWL. So I don't know about you, but I love to see a lot of interaction between and among learners in a reading lesson. And then finally, prompting higher order or critical thinking. Um, I think that was very present throughout. So for example, they were predicting, they were making, and then you know maybe checking and maybe challenging some assumptions. They had to categorize the information um, by using the graphic organizer, the timeline. And then by asking the right types of questions, not just display questions, then they were also having to make inferences and draw conclusions. Okay, so as you think about this, be sure to um, think about how you might apply those practices with materials or content that you are teaching. All right, we're gonna go on to another sample. This time, I'm showing you an example that would be from, say, a high intermediate to advanced level, for a high intermediate to advanced level class. And I love to choose topics that I think might be of general interest to a wide variety of students. Um, so I've chosen the topic of the science of happiness. Maybe you've seen videos or read articles about that topic. The reason I think this is important is that it might represent the sort of content that students would find in a post-secondary setting or maybe um, say here in the United States if they're working towards their high school equivalency. They might be thinking about these kinds of psycho you know, um, psychological theories, topics. Um, and again, if, but for any student, it's a, it's a topic of wide appeal, okay? So the first step um, in a lesson on the science of happiness before we even look at a reading text is to think about the topic using, in this case, a Venn diagram graphic organizer. So students with a partner would think about what comes to mind when, when they think about happiness and what would be their definition of happiness. And then as they talk to their partner, they're going to categorize that information um, with my definition, anything that's only in my definition on the left, my partner's on the right, and then anything that's similar in the middle of this graphic. So that would be our pre-reading step. Okay? Now, um, rest assured that later when you, when you download the, um, the resource I've provided for this, I have a handout with um, ideas and resources and websites you can go to. I've also given you a copy of this whole article on the science of happiness. But oftentimes, um, an authentic longer article is quite long, and there are some ways that we can um, make it more accessible by using the jigsaw approach. We'll see what we mean by that. By using the jigsaw approach, we can make a text more accessible. By using the jigsaw approach, we can also present a lot of collaboration and very meaningful collaboration among students which then leads to practice with effective communication. So we're looking at this article and it's about studies 
on the benefits of using a variety of happiness enhancers. So one, for example, is a gratitude journal. And if you notice in this sample, which we'll call technique A in this jigsaw activity that I'm presenting, um, you'll notice that the, some words are underlined, which is, and some words are bold. It was found that. So the purpose here is that the underlined words represent that they, they signal to the reader that's those are the words that are going to tell us the definition of a gratitude journal. And then the words that are bolded, do you see that that's the language that tells us we're reporting on some results. So in one study, it was found that, and then a, di a gratitude journal, which is when people keep track of things they're grateful for in a diary, that signals for the learner where they're going to find a definition and where they're going to find results. Well, why do we want to do that? Because now each learner will be given one of the four happiness enhancers and one of the four sections of the article that reports on a study. And they have to find the definition and write that on the left hand side of their row and then describe the results. OK, so this graphic organizer has two benefits. It provides the students with a structure of the text. In other words, it's a text that has four sections. So the graph graphic organizer represents that for us. But the graphic organizer also represents something more about the text genre or what it's about. It's showing us that there's a cause effect relationship in the reading. OK, so as you'll see, um, using a graphic organizer can serve as sort of a template um, or a visual representation of a text type. Now, learners have each had their section of the reading, and there will be several students. If you have a large class, you can have you know, eight A's, eight B's, eight C's, eight D's. It doesn't matter. You could have, if you have a small class with 10 people, you'll have you know, two students. So they work with others that have their same section to make sure they found the information in their section of the reading. And they only receive their section. So now, the reason we call it jigsaw is we need to put the parts of the reading back together. So the learners now are going to mingle. They're going to um, walk around the class. Or you, could, you can create new groups with ABCD members. But I love to do the mingle approach where they go and interview people around the room who read different sections so that they can now fill in the complete graphic organizer with what is the technique and then what are the results of using the technique according to the research. But what's essential here is that we provide learners with the language frames they'll need to talk about their study or to talk about the data. So, you know, when they go to somebody and say, okay, what is, what is acts of kindness? And they get the definition, then the person with acts of kindness would say, well, it was found that, the study showed that, or the researcher found that. So we're giving them these academic language frames. Finally, learners can conduct their own research. To do that, I love to use the technique called one question interview where they're going to pose questions to one another, collect some data, analyze the data, create graphs, and make uh, short presentations to each other. So now, as we go through the steps, think about a topic for which this might work in your setting. So each learner is assigned one of four questions. So you'll have multiple ones, multiple twos, OK? How likely are you to try the gratitude journal? How likely are you to try performing acts of kindness? Because now they've learned about those from one another, and they're going to see how likely they are to try those. And I always say to them, make sure you ask why. So as they're interviewing and collecting their data and collecting tally marks, they also will ask each other why they would use that practice. And then they get into groups. Those who had question one get together, those that had question two, and they're going to analyze their data. But again, we want to make sure that we provide them with the academic language frames they need in order to talk about the data. So we look at question one. Wow, many people in class said they're very likely, to, or they're, they're somewhat likely to use gratitude journals, OK? Um, about, let's see, if we look at this, maybe a little over half the class are not at all likely, um, 2 thirds of the class. So we need to provide the language frames in order to talk about the data, and then the learners when they create a bar graph, or I used this lesson just recently, and the students chose to do pie charts in their, in their class with me, um, then they do short presentations to others in small groups, just using their graph. 
So just imagine what that what skills are being developed there. Oftentimes we need to read about something at work or in um, school. We have to read about it, then create a visual, and then we have to come to work, go to school, go to class, and present that information. So we're like as I said earlier, we're really milking the topic and we're, we're extending that reading to now develop many, many more skills. So let's see, so how did we do this time? Um, you know, just a show of hands if you, would you agree that we did all four of these? Just be thinking about that. Go ahead and sh a show of hands here. Raise your hand if you think we addressed all four of these principles with our activities. And now let's reflect a little bit, be thinking about that as I share my ideas. Let's think about how we did that, okay? So lots of scaffolds again. So the Venn diagram, remember, was like a compare and contrast. So we're talking to someone else and deciding what are the similarities and differences with our um, definitions of happiness, which prompts a lot of critical thinking, but it's also the, the Venn diagram itself provides the scaffold to do that. The chart, remember the chart represented the text genre. We've got four categories on this um, study. It's a study, a report on studies that shows a cause and effect relationship. And then we provided all sorts of language frames throughout. Um, to build academic language, I mean the language frames obviously themselves, but also the bolding and underlining in the article was a way to direct the learner's attention to that language. And then they were given um, the supports they needed to talk about results. They learned quantifying language um, you know, two-thirds of the class, three-quarters of the class, and then in collaborating with one another with the Venn diagram, jigsaw, the interviews, the data analysis, think of all that. All of those activities prompted, promoted collaborations. So these are, you know, this is a series of tasks that might, might extend over a few lessons. This may not happen in an hour's class, okay? So, you know, this, depending on how deeply you go with the different steps, this could be um, really as long or as short as you, you know, is suitable for your setting. And then lots and lots of higher order thinking, predicting, um, challenging assumptions, categorizing again, analyzing, synthesizing information, okay? All right, so again, Lots and lots of ideas there that, now this was a very advanced level text and you might be thinking, gosh, how would that work with beginners? Well, actually, um, I use one question interview, for example, at all levels, all topics with any material. So I just wanted to share briefly here um, a different example, different topic of using a one question interview on a topic of how I practice my English outside of class. And this could be used with beginning level. Actually, I have others where I use visual prompts only. How often do you, and I have a picture, like text message, read the newspaper. Um, so with, with maybe even literacy level students, and you're talking about here, um, simple present, adverbs of frequency or adverbial phrases. So one question interview can be used at any level, any topic, any material. The other um, extensions that I show, the graphic organizer, um, creating the simple graphics, all of those things can be used at any level. Okay, so let's do one more. All right, so this time I wanna focus on the development of writing and um, talk about a technique I call gathering learner input as the basis for writing, okay? And what we'll see is that this approach serves as, you know, it builds on the learners, um, maybe their oral language is more of a strength for them. So it builds on that oral language and it, um, the, the learner input, as you'll see, it itself provides a scaffold for the research process. A lot of times we want learners to conduct research. They're gonna become researchers in the classroom, so to speak. You're gonna see how this approach can prompt really extensive, really meaningful collaboration among learners and then finally prompt a lot of great critical thinking. So the first step in this approach is to think about a topic in your curriculum that you want to explore more deeply. So in my, in my example here, the topic is caring for the elderly. How do we care for the elderly in different contexts around the world? I actually, um, this, I developed this working with a team that had a uh, nursing certificate program. Um, but have you noticed that a lot of uh, curricula will have health as a topic? So it's um, choosing a topic that could really resonate with folks from all over the world. 
um, you know, to, to explore this topic deeply. I think we have different cultural practices. We have different ideas about what this could look like. So again, you can use any topic, but this is what we use. So in your family or community, where do the elderly usually live? Who has the responsibility of caring for aging parents? And who makes medical decisions for sick parents? Just recently, I was talking to some in-laws of mine in France. My, I have family in France. And they were, there's some really striking differences as far as who makes decisions um, and how much information is relayed. In fact, in some cases, in some cultures, the doctors will only talk to the children and won't even divulge things to parents. So there are really some striking differences in practices, right? So the learners will mingle and take short notes as they're walking around the class. We really want to emphasize that this graphic provides them a chance to practice good note taking, which is, you know, not a whole sentence, just key words. The other thing that we can teach them is as they write down a word and they talk to somebody else who says the same thing, they can just put a check mark next to that. So those are some great academic strategies. Okay, so they've collected their data. They've collected their data. Now, each um, you know, pairs of students or small groups of students, and depending on your class size. Um, they're assigned one of those questions. So one of the, let's say one pair is assigned, you know, what did people have to say about caring for aging parents? Who cares for your aging parents? And let's say that one of the answers is it's the eldest child. Then they have to infer or make some guesses as to, well, why? I wonder why that is. Maybe it's the cultural beliefs. Um, so we want to give them the language they need to make those um, inferences. So maybe it's because, or it could be that, or it would seem that. So in other words, so they've gathered information about a question and they're going to look for any trends, what do they notice, and they're going to try to make some inferences about that. Okay, then the next step is to take that information that they've gathered and use uh, this time for writing. We're going to write a short report about the class that um, reflects what our particular group had to say about the topic. So what I love here is that it's extremely learner-centered, isn't it? Um, each group that creates a report using the same set of materials that I've shown you will develop their own original report that reflects their thinking, which is really, really nice. So paragraph frames provide a scaffold for the language we need to make a report so um, people said that um, because of these similarities, it, it gives you the academic language you need to show the, you know, um, what they found as far as similarities and differences in views on a particular topic. Um, and then little by little, you can remove the scaffold. Okay, so this provides an initial support and then little by little, we can remove the scaffolds and have students create something that's completely original. All right, so how did we do this time? Okay, so think about we, you know, what, think to yourself before I show the answers. How did we scaffold learning? How did we build academic language and prompt collaborations? And how did we prompt critical thinking? Okay, well, so the graphics, the scaffolds this time were the, well, the graphic organizer that we used for collecting information. So it was a, you know, think of it, you had the big idea. And then we had the three sections. We had the big idea of caring for the elderly, and then each column represented a different key question. Okay, so we're sort of seeing how those three ideas are supported by a bigger idea. Um, we worked with a universal topic. I think that's a scaffold for learning. It's something that would be of interest. Everybody has something they can say about that topic. We also provided language frames and a paragraph frame. And then lots of focus on academic language, giving them the languages they need for making inferences, and then the report was sort of a compare, they're sort of comparing and contrasting what they found. And so you give the comparative language in the, in the frame itself. And then lots of collaboration, the mingling, the analysis in teams, and then making inferences, challenging assumptions, categorizing information, comparing, contrasting, analyzing. Look at all that great higher order critical thinking that's happening um, in this, um, this sample. Okay. So. So let's think, just to kind of review, think of all the practices we looked at. So one question interview, data gathering, graph creation, jigsaw, using graphic organizers, asking quality, quality questions, and the academic language sentence frames and paragraph frames. These are things that you can add to any lesson, in my mind, and to any, at any level and in any curriculum. 
the other thing to think about is, you know, where do I see these in the materials? So I know that in some programs, programs, um, they, if it's a, let's say a small community-based program here in the States working with adult, uh, adult immigrant students, they may not have the resources where students can buy books or that they can supply books to learners. Um, or you may be in places around the world where you are using, you know, published materials. So look, I mean, if you're using something like Ventures here in the States or Prism or First Draft, um, or other books, there are a variety of publishers that are making a, really make, working hard to um, make sure that these sorts of things are included. See if those are in the existing materials. But even if they're not, these are just things that we can add very easily to anything that we're doing. So um, I'd love to take your questions now. Have, I, wanna, I wanted to leave time for questions, and I think we're in good shape here. We've got about seven, eight minutes. Um, so let's see. Uh, okay, so oh, I love this here. Let me start with one. How do you motivate students to really engage with the KWL? And students will often say they don't know anything about the topic. That's a really good question, a really fair question. Um, actually, I think that's one reason KWL has kind of lost, um, gone out of favor in um, some K-12 settings where I think, um, especially with younger adolescent learners, they're sort of embarrassed to admit that they don't know <laughs> something. But I think one of the what well, one thing is to model KWL. Um, so maybe do it as a whole group first, so that it's not as intimidating, um, or using it collaboratively with others, and not ever singling students out to ask them directly what they do or don't know about a particular topic. Um, I think that's one way to, to really motivate uh, students to engage with it. If you find that it's a technique that doesn't work so well with your learners, um, you know, maybe, you, maybe you jump to the what do you want to learn and what did you learn. Um, and then going back to the KWL uh, offers an opportunity to um, push students to then go do their own research and learn more and maybe come back to that chart the next day. So that's one way to think about that. I hope that's a helpful suggestion, and um, you know, I'm sure that you may have some other other ideas. Um, let's see. So, is this four-step framework the basis for your pedagogy? Does this become um, repetitive for students to follow? Or uh, th I'm sorry, um, I'm not quite sure what the question. Is. Does this become? Um, well, I think if what what I hear in this question is. Um, I love to build routines into teaching. So um, I don't, I, I, when I think about a framework to my teaching personally, um, I wouldn't name it as, say, a four step framework necessarily, but it's always, you know, what do students know? What, do, you know, really activating their prior knowledge on a topic and then engaging them with really meaningful practice. And I feel like these high leverage practices that we talked about today can really serve to do that. And then allowing, you know, giving students a lot of practice using those same techniques um, over and over. Um, somebody asked here, I saw somebody in the, I, it's not up here, um, I, I saw something about math. And so can you use this with math content? Content, And I would have to say absolutely a resounding yes to that. Um, think about the different samples that we did today. So we had, um, the one question interview for the science of happiness and people's views on how they might use the practices or my sample on how you learn English outside of the classroom and you could use it for any variety of topics. Now think about all of the work you could do, all the numeracy work you could do. Now I'm not an expert in math um, and I don't claim to be or I could never teach math but I've worked with math teachers who said that that approach could work very, very effectively for a variety of mathematical principles and functions. Just in an ESL class, we work on percentages, we work, you know, on, on proportion, um, averages. So absolutely, I would say that um, lots and lots of ways that we could work on math. Um, we have another question here about the jigsaw. Do you give the parts of the reading out on pieces of paper or do you give it on one handout? And um, in saying that, you know, I get, I have a hard time getting my students to stay on one section of the reading. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, if you're, um, if you have the means to create uh, four, you know, small sections, you know, make, make copies of the reading, cut it into four. I think that's always better if you can do that. Because absolutely, you're absolutely right that learners will kind of try to gravitate to the other sections 
And the whole point of Jigsaw is to um, lighten the load by giving them only one part of the reading. But then what I like to do is, if I can, give them the whole reading to take home and read at their leisure, come back to that again if they have uh, other questions. Okay, um, let me see, I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling through um, the, the, the questions here that... I want to thank So, you. Uh, Kyoko and Drew, are you seeing... I, I'm, I see some questions that you've provided yes. here for me. Um, and I don't know if there are others but I, I provided you with my email. You'll see today that when you download your certificate, you can also download a document addressing the demands of today's world. And in there, I've provided you with a whole array of resources that I think you'll find very useful. One of them is a video series that um, I had the privilege of being a part of uh, working on through a nonprofit with Marianne Flores several years ago. But what's exciting about the series, I like to recommend it, is that the teachers in the series are using a lot of these practices. Um, it's called the New American Horizons series, so I've given you a link to that. Also, um, ESL Pro is a series of a set of materials that were developed through the U.S. Department of Education, the office of the from OCTE, the Office for Adult Education, and in there we see lots and lots of um, great resources um, through some online free modules, some research briefs, as well as some online digital magazines. So I've provided you with all of the um, links to those um, in that handout. And I also want to suggest that if you're interested in how a lot of these practices would work with beginners, um, Patsy Egan is doing a session tomorrow in this uh, online conference on the college and career readiness standards with beginners. And you will not be disappointed. You're going to, that'll be a great experience. And I think it'll um, show you a lot of these uh, in, in the beginning level. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, great question here. Uh, Dawn asks, what about students who do not like paired or group work and complain? You know, that's such a good question. I was visiting a site once and um, I explained, I was, I was a practicum and, you know, supervisor and we were in a host teacher's class and the students were complaining to me and my student teachers that we were doing too much group work. And I said to the students, well, think about when you use English outside of class, just think about it. And I even suggested that they keep a log of how and when they need to use English outside of class. And so really name with the students how they need to collaborate at work, how they need to collaborate in the community. And then really, you know, name that and say to them, well, you know, this is what we're practicing here. We're rehearsing for those um, interactions outside of the class. And I have to say, the learner who asked me that and in the presence of the host teacher, his jaw kind of dropped and he said, oh my gosh, I hadn't really thought of it that way. So I think one thing is just to be really, my point is to be really, really clear, really explicit with students about why you're using particular techniques and strategies. And to remind them that in order to improve their language skills, they need to use their language skills. So I know that's, you know, it's not an easy one to overcome, um, but that's just some, something that I found is that the more explicit I am about why I'm using these kinds of strategies, um, the more buy-in I see among students in classes. So, um, you know, I am a professor working with teachers as my full-time job, but I have the great privilege of spending a lot of time in ESL classrooms because of the practicum in our program. And in that practicum, I do co-teaching. I, I get up in front of the classroom just like you all. Um, and I, that's, that's something that I found is really, really helpful. Um, 